Good morning, everyone. I'm Hugo Barbosa. I'm a lecturer of computer science at the University of Exeter. Um, I'm going to be chairing this fourth section of our Complement Live. But before we get started, first, I want to thank you all for joining us in the second day of our Complement Live. I want also to thank the, all the organizing committee that I want have time to name all of them, but I want to thank the organized committee and as well as our sponsors. I also want to thank you all the authors and the speakers who are gonna be participating in our Complement Live. So thank you so much for um, accepting this invitation to give your presentation and sharing your work with us. So, um, we, I'm gonna start with, before we get started with the presentation, I'm gonna start with um, some um, housekeeping rules for us to uh, follow for this online event. So it's gonna be, it's probably gonna be slightly different from normal conferences, but we, we are gonna try to keep it as smooth as possible. Yesterday, everything went fine. The conference was um, um, fantastic, no, technical issues and um, yeah, it was really, really good. Everything was on schedule, everything on time. So thank you all, thank you the speakers for um, staying on time. So, okay, um, how are we gonna proceed? For the ones who are in the Zoom uh, meeting, we are gonna ask you all to uh, not start your cameras. We, we cannot, like prevent or block you from start the camera, but I, I kindly ask you to, to stop your cameras. We're gonna keep everyone on mute, but um, after the presentations, if you, you have a presentation, if you have a question, you are gonna be able to uh, ask your question. I can unmute you and you can ask your question if you want. So, um, in this fourth section of our Complement Live, we're gonna have three presentations. The first presentation, let me, uh, you are seeing the, the schedule on, on, the, on the live feed, but um, we're gonna have three sections, three presentations. We're gonna start with Ilya Rausch with the word collective decision-making on triadic graphs. Then we're gonna have Fabian Brasman presenting the work Mining the Automotive Industry, a Network Analysis of Corporate Positioning and Technological Trends. And our third and last presentation of this session um, is gonna be presented by Babak Ravandi, who is gonna be presenting the work Network-Based Approach for Modeling and Analyzing Coronary and Geography. We, for the presenter, for the speakers, we're gonna proceed as follows. We are gonna make you a co-host so you can share your screen when you have to start a presentation. Um, and you are gonna have 15 minutes for your presentation plus five minutes for questions. And I'm gonna kindly, and in the, I will try to be as smooth as possible. I'm gonna give you a kind reminder when you have five minutes left to finish your presentation in one minute. And I'll try to be as little disruptive as possible. Um, so I'd like you to ask you all to try to stay on time. One thing that might want to do is to keep your phone on your desk so you can keep track of your time as well. Um, we're gonna be answering the questions both from for the questions asked here on, on the Zoom meeting, but also if you are on our YouTube live stream, you can ask questions as well. And we are gonna ask the speaker uh, on your behalf. Um, I think that's um, um, basically this, what I had for our, our rules. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us in this um, on Planet Live 
I really hope that we can have the actual component event next year here in Yaxton. So you can come here and we can um, meet and we can see your work um, in an actual physical conference. So yeah, I will um, start the, we will start the presentations shortly with the work of Ilya Rausch. Um, um, and Ilya, uh, you are a co-host already. So you can start sharing your screen and okay. we can start the presentation shortly. Okay, thank you, Hugo. By the way, perfect pronunciation of my name. That doesn't happen often, but you did it very well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. You should be able to see now the title slide, if it's working. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we can see. One thing that we, it might happen that we, I noticed yesterday is that sometimes depending on the screen size of the, the speaker, the slides might seem like cut on the edges. So if you're if you if you're if you're not seeing the entire slides, you can move your mouse to the top of your screen, and you're gonna see a green bar saying that um, the presenter is sharing the screen. And there is a button view options, and you can change that to fit to window instead of original size. And then you're going to be able to see the entire screen of the presenter. Yeah, but I think uh, so far it's going quite well, actually. It should be, should be working. Another thing that um, um, we we are asking the speakers to do is to also to to <clears throat> start their cameras so we can see the speaker and we can connect the work to the author. So since we are not on a uh, room seeing you presenting your work, so it's up to the author, also up to the speaker to turn the camera on or not. But I think it's good so we can see the author behind that work. Thank you, Ilya. Of course. So hello everyone, I'm Hugo Barbosa again, just to, for the people who are joining us on YouTube now, we are starting the session, uh, the fourth section of our Complanet Live. And our first presenter today, our first speaker is Ilya Rausch, and he's gonna be presenting the work collective decision-making on triadic graphs. Ilya, you have um, 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hugo, and good morning to everyone who joined. Uh, in this talk, you will get new information on how to construct networks from triadic motives and which network motives can impact collective behavior. In 2002, 
Milo and colleagues discovered that many real world networks have subgraphs that occur significantly more frequently than expected from random networks. And this slide shows some examples extracted from their original publication. The authors coined these subgraphs network motives and suggested that they might be fundamental building blocks of various networks. There were a couple of other previous studies from the areas of ecological and social sciences that pointed to similar observations around 1980s. However, particularly after the publication of Milo and colleagues, a number of studies reported on the existence of network motives in various areas, including neuronal, financial, or social networks. One very prominent and often reoccurring type of motive is the feed-forward loop. It can be considered as part of a family of motives called closed triadic motives, which we focused on in our work. So here is the feed-forward loop. Another well-known type is the feedback loop. And this is the bidirectional loop, the most straightforward closed triadic motive. An intriguing property of these motives is that there are many symmetries and close relationships. For example, consider the degree. The total degree of the feedforward loop is equal to the one of feedback loop. And it is smaller than the one of the uplinked mutual diet by a factor of four thirds, or by a factor of two compared to the bidirectional loop. To study the influence of the motive type on network systems, one promising yet not well known approach is to generate triadic graphs from Steiner triple systems. This is an idea that was previously proposed by Winkler and Reicher. Steiner triple systems are graphs that consist of exactly quantifiable triangles. This is because the triangles are distinct meaning there are no two triangles that have a mutual link. Such distinct triangles can also be called triads. Next, similarly to the erdos rainy model, where the edge assignment is not conditioned on the state of the network, we generate triadic random graphs by randomly sampling conditionally independent triads from the Steiner triple systems and applying the motif topology, in this case, the feed-forward loop. A downside of a Steiner triple system is that there are conditions on the number of nodes and triangles. However, as long as those conditions are met, the Steiner triple systems are scalable, which is very convenient. Um, in particular, every node can be a Steiner triple system itself, so we can easily increase the network size. Finally, in our work, to guarantee that there is always a unique giant component, we did not sample the triads completely at random. Instead, we first generated a seed network to which we then added uh, randomly sampled triads, which were by far the majority of the net networked triads. So we obtained a triadic graph. And uh, in most of our cases, we consider homogeneous triadic graphs, meaning there is only one type of motif included. The influence, the influence of triadic motifs was considered in relation to a collective decision-making inspired from locusts. In that decision-making scenario, which is an extended version of the prominent Shirok model, each locust had to decide whether to march right or left. The locus could switch its marching direction randomly with the probability PS. Each locust is a member of a swarm, connected to its peers by a communication network, thus the decision-making is collective. Finally, the swarm is confined within a ring-shaped arena, so their movement could be approximated as almost one-dimensional as uh, indicated in this video from a very interesting paper, by the way. To briefly elaborate on the model, each locust updates its opinion at every time step. This opinion is influenced by some noise 
and a spontaneous switching factor, which is minus one with probability PS that I mentioned previously, and one otherwise. Moreover, the opinion is influenced by its neighbors, essentially the average of its neighbors' opinions, and a sign function that helps the opinion converge faster towards one or minus one. As a result, we obtain a symmetry breaking and self-organization problem, and thus a member of a very interesting family of challenging complex behaviors. However, unlike the pioneering, pioneering group cited in this slide, we did not use real locusts, but simulated them with robots, so robots acting as locusts. This gave us the freedom to omit the localization and consider the problem from a novel angle where we are able to control the network topology, network nodes being the robots, and apply the triadic graphs to purely focus on the influence of the different motive types, we begin with static networks with the intention of extending the analysis to dynamic and adaptive networks in the future. Despite that the networks are static, we observed important qualitative similarities to the experiments with real locusts. In particular, we observed that the collective state which is the sum of all marching directions across the swarm, strongly depends on the average network degree or the number of interactions, basically. With low degree, there is no consensus, meaning phi, the collective state, is fluctuating around zero. With high degree, in contrast, there is a stable state with high coherence and for intermediate degree, there are multiple transitions between the temporary states. To measure the group coherence, we took the absolute value of the collective state and we averaged it over the last 1000 seconds to make sure we are not incl including a transient period. This way, we obtain a single coherence value and we can do the same for other switching probabilities and network uh, motive types. This allows us to compare the influence of different triadic motives on group alignment. For example, we can see that the impact of the feed forward loop is rather inhibiting co coherence compared to other motives. In this plot, the continuous line represents the theoretical value of the maximum coherence and we can also see in the inset um, how far the co is the coherence from the maximum value. In contrast, feedback loops or the bidirectional loops bring the coherence closer to its maximum. The similarity between the feedback loop and loops and the bidirectional loops is a bit striking considering that the bidirectional loops have symmetrical interactions where each node can interact in both directions, while the feedback loop doesn't. Furthermore, we considered the null models. The null models were obtained by degree preserving randomization and led to similar results where the feed forward loop and the uplinked mutual diet motive inhibit the coherence more than others. Note that both, both motives have a node with no outgoing links. So it does, this node does not communicate its opinion. It is interesting that the nodes with zero in degree, uh, unlike these nodes with zero out, out degree, uh, have a similar function, uh, um, do not show a similarly strong influence as nodes with zero degree. So those nodes with uh, zero in degree could also be um, have a similar function to zealots. However, in our results, one can see that they behave similarly to the bidirectional loops, for example, where all nodes have a in degree and out degree higher than zero. And so far, all networks had the same average degree. However, the difference in influence between the feed forward and the feedback loops becomes even more apparent when we consider networks with different degree. We can increase the average degree 
by increasing the number of triads in the network. And yeah, you have five minutes. Thank you. And we saw that even when it is eight times higher, the feed forward loop still has a more inhibiting influence than the feedback loop. To have a closer loop, we can gradually switch numbers of feed forward loops in the network to feedback loops. And we can see then that then the number of nodes with zero outgoing links decreases linearly, while the inherent directionality or the hierarchicality of the network decreases non-linearly. So together, they are contributing to the nonlinear nature of the coherence. And this might be the final piece of the puzzle. The presence of nodes with zero outgoing links is why the feedforward loop and the uplinked mutual diet motive are rather inhibiting coherence when uh, we have no models where the network degree is preserved, and, but no triadic motives are uh, in there. While the hierarchicality may explain why the feedforward loop stands out as an additional inhibiting impact when, the, when we have the triadic graph, so with an abundance of motives. To recap, <clears throat> network motives occur in various real world networks and could be considered their building blocks. Here we focused on the closed triadic motives. We have shown how to create networks with exactly quantifiable distinct triadic motives which we use to study a toy model of collective decision-making where agents need to decide between two options. We saw that the simulated behavior was qualitatively similar to that observed for real-world uh, locusts, where the state trajectory can be strongly unstable depending on the number of interactions. Then we compared the group coherence between different types of motives. Feed-forward loop and uplinked mutual diet motive have a more inhibiting inf impact than other motives. The strong difference between um, the feed forward and the feedback loops could not be offset by increasing number of triads. And maybe it attributed to the number of nodes with zero outgoing links, as well as the hierarchicality of the triadic graphs, which are connected to the motive topology. Finally, note that lower coherence is not necessarily a disadvantage to a collective system. On the contrary, it can, be it can be a benefit when adaptive behavior is favored. For example, um, when the environment is dynamic. Our results suggest that it might be interesting, for example, to, to look at a scenario where swarm robots switch between the different motive types, depending on whether explorative or exploitative behavior is preferable. This could be not too, hard, not too hard since all they need to do is switch from dominantly feed forward to feedback loop network, meaning switching only one edge per triad, or from feed forward loop to bidirectional connections. And so far we focused only on the closed triadic motives, but in future, it could be worthwhile to consider other motive types such as open triadic motives <coughs> or closed quadratic motives. Finally, it would also be interesting to study triadic graphs with other decision-making models, or more generally, other dynamics, for example, uh, opinion formation or the spread of indices. On a final note, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for making this virtual conference possible, and thank you all for listening and the interest in our research. Thank you very much, Ilya, thank you. Um, very nice work. Uh, if you if you have you. questions, you can either um, post the question on the chat, or you can say that you have a question, and I can unmute you so you can ask your question. So I I'd like to 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 ask a question. You mentioned this in your uh, last slide about the potential for it to help us to understand opinion dynamics, large scale opinion dynamics. To what extent do you do you do you think that these uh, triadic graphs they can help us to understand the emergence of phenomena such as polarization or echo chambers in uh, large scale uh, real uh, networks? I, I know that it is a it's a much simpler uh, like domain, of course, but I think. Maybe these structural properties that can emerge from these local or these micro structures could help us to 
perhaps even to give answers to these problems of um, that we're seeing in opinion dynamics. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, very, very interesting question. So um, first, um, to make it clear, what we did here is we considered a very minimal approach because um, I believe that uh, the impact of network motives is not yet well understood. And uh, usually the approach would be to take real world networks and uh, see if they have a certain density of motives. Look at the Z score, for example, and then <clears throat> look at the behaviors um, or the dynamics that emerge on those networks. Just sorry, just a second. <clears throat> Instead, our philosophy was to understand the subtle differences between the motive types in a better way. We isolated the networks from other topological um, features, from um, occurrences of, um, for example, uh, scale-free uh, topology or, or similar, um, to be able to really focus uh, on the distinct number of motives and the differences of the distinct uh, motives, uh, topologies. So if we would apply it, for example, to uh, dynamics where echo chambers could be observed or polarization, I could uh, imagine that this uh, could occur quite um, easily in networks that are, for example, heterogeneous, that have um, uh, two types, for example, of uh, motives, where one type is some highly clustered um, feedback loops and one type, um, for example, feed forward loops uh, or other types. And so in those parts where we have uh, dominant uh, feedback loops, I could imagine that something like uh, echo chamber behavior could emerge. Um, our idea is that uh, taking this uh, bottom up approach with considering very idealistic synthetic networks at first, and then making them more real world like by adding uh, additional features could uh, also lead to a good understanding of how these motives and how the differences between the motives play into the dynamic systems and how they influence them. I hope that answers you your question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, cool. Any other questions from the, from the audience? So, yeah, so thank you very much, Ilya. So if you have a question, you can type here in Ilya. If you can, if you can stay with us uh, for the session and maybe you can answer some question that people might send you on chat. Okay, um, thank you. I'd like to ask you to stop sharing your screen now. And we're gonna start our second presentation now. Our uh, next speaker, is um, our next speaker is Fabian Bresman, who is going to be presenting the work on mining the automotive industry, a network analysis of corporate positioning and technological trends. Um, Fabian, you have been made a co-host already, so I'd like to ask you to uh, test if you can share your your screen. Yeah, so here's the screen, and now you should be able to see the slideshow. So you are able to see the slideshow right now? Fantastic, fantastic. Okay. All right, so Fabian, you have uh, 15 minutes for your presentation and five minutes for, for questions. And I will try to, uh, I, will be, I will like give you a reminder when you have five minutes left. And I'll try to be as subtle as possible. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, for all for having me here and giving me the opportunity to present our research. So my name is Fabian Bresemann. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford, where I work at the Site Business School and at the Oxford Internet Institute. And the work I'm going to talk about today, mining the automotive industry, is a joint work in particular with Niklas Stör, a former student of mine who worked with the IBM AI core, um, a colleague of him, and um, another of his former professors at University College London. 
And the paper, the title is Mining the Automotive Industry in Network Analysis of Corporate Positioning and Technological Trends. So you hear from the title already that it is a very applied piece of research that I'm going to present here, a very applied network analysis. I hope nonetheless that this might be of interest to you and um, looking very much forward to your feedback. And um, just a way you can find the work, obviously it's uh, also uh, published in the, in the proceedings of the, of the conference. So now let me try to go on here. So what is the motivation? The motivation in the background is um, the digital transformation and overall a, a process that is affecting the economy, the society, every aspect of, of life in the 21st century. And obviously it is challenging industries, particularly those industries that are in place for a long time. Companies face huge innovation pressure. We analyze um, one of the more classical industries here in our paper, the automotive industry, I'll tell you why in a minute. In general, um, firms that go through this process of digital transformation, they would um, want to catch up with the latest innovations that are available on the market in order to get a competitive edge, in order to um, yeah, be, develop a sustainable business model for um, 21st century, for long-term basically profitability and to keep all employees in place. And um, this is basically more, more or less the background. And the problem is that obviously, Innovation is a dynamic process as it is developing right now. So it's an uncertain, groping in the dark process, more or less. So firms do not know where the path is that they're actually steering to. And on top of it, firms obviously have an incentive to hide how innovative they are in certain, in certain aspects, or they would not want to share all of it with their competitors for free. But at the same time, firms would want to get an objective perspective on the innovativeness of competitors and industries in order to understand um, where they are, where they should go to, and um, how best to develop. This is the background, this is the, the real world problem we want, to under, we, um, we want to target here in our paper. And in order to help in this regard, we present a web mining tool that we developed, or web mining application, that analyzes the website structures of firms as a complex, net, as a complex network and in this uh, network, it identified the importance of innovative topics um, and um, a few other things that I will talk about in a, in a second. And the, basically the USP of our paper or the, the value added from our paper is that we just use freely available, publicly available data, just all the content published on the websites, bring it into a network structure in understanding and analyzing um, the links between the different elements of the websites and from this from, from, from this network analysis infer how companies are positioned with regards to innovative trends. And we present this on the example of the automotive industry for a few reasons. First, um, the automotive industry is one of the most important industries in the world. Obviously, it's one of the big manufacturers. Um, the large car manufacturers um, are responsible for hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, they add a lot to, um, to um, the overall GDP of, of countries, for example, in Germany, the country I'm from, where it is a very important core industry. And obviously, um, all of us know that the automotive industry is one of the more classical uh, sectors of the economy that is currently transforming because of several mega trends, environmental concerns and issues, the trend towards e-mobility, then autonomous driving and AI and connectivity and sharing. And this is exactly what we investigate here. But before we come to the results, one slide about the methodology we have used. Again, we use just um, freely available tools and data sets to conduct all the analysis. So we have just used um, freely available web mining software. Uh, Screaming Crop was one of them, but you will find more details about the methodology in the paper. And we use the software to crawl the websites of the three largest car manufacturers as an example. So we looked into Hyundai, Volkswagen and Toyota. And we started, you see it here on the right hand side, we always started with the US American website. So we started with HyundaiUSA.com, VW.com and Toyota.com. We looked on this website, looked for all the links to other subdomains on level two, then the same on level three, level four, level five and level six. So overall we, got a deep look into deep kind of um, magnification into the, into the website networks. And this led eventually to several thousand nodes, so several thousand websites connected by 
almost 100 or more than 100,000 links between all these websites. This is what we did, and this is how we constructed the network, which you see here on the following slide. We see that um, the resulting web page networks show very distinct structures, and we see that the positioning of innovative topics is different between the three um, large car manufacturers. So on the left-hand side, you see the website network of Toyota, in the middle of Volkswagen, on the right-hand side, Hyundai. This is visualized with the software Gephi. And the individual nodes and the individual small dots here are the websites. Um, the links between them are the hyperlinks. And the nodes and hyperlinks are colored um, to visualize um, the different topics uh, by the three innovative trends here. So dark blue is e-mobility and environment, light blue is connectivity and sharing, and purple is autonomous driving and AI, gray is other. Um, in order to um, label a website with a certain topic, we just look for predefined keywords that you can also find in the paper. So we look for e-mobility and environmental keywords, connectivity and sharing keywords, and so on and so forth. And, and then we looked into the different structures. And what you see here is obviously um, um, a very distinct st structure between the different between the different websites. For example, you see that Volkswagen is not talking as much as the other two about e-mobility and environment. You see many more gray websites, obviously, uh, but at the same time, Volkswagen is talking much more about autonomous driving and AI in certain aspects of their website network. So, for example, you see that within the within the subset of the website um, under the umbrella term media, under the core website media, you see that there's actually some probably an outreach channel more um, aspect of the website where the company talks about autonomous driving and AI, while from Toyota, for example, you see on many, many websites um, within the web page network that they talk about e-mobility and environment. This is just a very uh, bird's eye perspective on the networks. And here we look into more here we look into more um, descriptive statistics on the next few slides. For example, what we find again, looking into Volkswagen's network here, we look into the sentiment of the web content. We performed a, um, a sentiment analysis of the content published on each individual website. And we see that the web content sentiment reflect the network centrality of the web pages. On the right hand side, you see the network, again, the same network we saw before, but this time colored according to the sentiment. And on the left hand side, you see the no degree centrality. We have um, put the uh, nodes into these sides here for better visualization and the sentiment on the y axis, on the vertical axis. And you see that it is those websites in the um, middle range of the degree central uh, of the centrality that show the most positive sentiment. So obviously, the website owners, basically Volkswagen's web, web designers, they put an emphasis on um, those content-driven um, co so content websites um, that are in the middle of the network centrality, basically. So not on the top, which is most of them navigational pages, and not at the bottom, which is most of them uh, more specific warranty issues and detailed uh, manual-like instructions, but rather on those content-driven websites. But all of this becomes more interesting, um, becomes, more, becomes more interesting if we look into um, the sentiment with regards to innovative topics. So here on this, um, on this um, box plot, you basically see uh, the centrality measured by the normalized page rank on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see the sentiment. The three rows are our car manufacturers, Hyundai, Toyota, Volkswagen, and each individual element is um, the innovative topics. And on the right-hand side in gray, you see basically the other web content. And what you see from this slide, I do not want to go into too many details here, you see that the innovative topics are presented more centrally and more positively than other topics or other web content on the websites. And again, you can use our web mining tool here to understand the differences between the companies. So for example, you see that Volkswagen is um, not putting too much effort in presenting centrally to, um, content on autonomous driving connect uh, connectivity in compared to comparison to others. So it's basically the normalist page rank. Um, the median one presented at the bottom here is more or less the same for all of them. And similarly, the sentiment is also not too much positive. And this is very different from, for example, Hyundai's effort on these um, innovative topics where they have a much more positive sentiment than the average, um, than the average web content presented on other topics. So the baseline here is um, 
you can use um, this very simple web crawling to understand um, w which kind of topics are discussed with regards to innovation and how they are discussed on the different large car manufacturers websites. And another interesting result is, um, uh, is if you look at, into the national domains. So if you abstract from just the US American website, but if you look more at the size of the networks with regards to all other kind of country domains, which we have done here for our three um, car manufacturers, and then we compared the size of the web page network for each individual country domain. So for example, .de for Germany, .uk for United Kingdom, and so on and so forth. We compare this with the total market size, so the total number of car sales in each country. And what you see is that there's a very um, clear similarity between all the three car manufacturers um, positioning, competitive positioning in the three uh, types of markets. So we have car sales not for all countries of the world, but for a good number of countries yeah. on the left hand side. Excuse me, you have a question? No, five minutes, just let me know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we will we will finish in a minute. So you see here on the left hand side is the smaller markets, so those that do not have many car sales overall. And you see um, also that the size of the web page network, so the share of all web pages by these three car manufacturers is relatively small. And you see a large cluster here at the top and at the top right, um, which is basically the industrialized high income countries. And interestingly, and these these large these larger clusters, these kind of most important clusters. Uh, also cover the majority of the web page contents of the web page effort put into these countries uh, by the three car manufacturers. And interestingly, each of the countries is putting most effort into their home market. So with Hyundai, 7% of all web pages are on the Korean domain, with Toyota, 6% are with the Japanese domain, and with Volkswagen, 6% are in the German domain. So there's a very clear competitive positioning here between the companies. And to wrap it up, the web mining tool that we present here in our study allows to gain insights into the corporate positioning of companies or any other institution with regards to innovative topics. So we can compare the innovative topics in applying a keyword analysis and looking into the positioning within the hierarchy of the web page, which is different to other approaches like search engine optimization, where you might just look into the appearance of words in general, but do not consider the hierarchy within the network. Then you can look into the sentiment to understand how positively uh, or negatively things are discussed. And we um, compare the size of the national web page networks. And to wrap it up and to summarize, the tool that we present here is highly transparent, reproducible, and data driven. And it could be used as a blueprint to monitor innovation in any industry or organizational context. Particularly if you were to apply this over time, um, then the tool could be applied as a monitoring, as a monitoring element in order to measure how innovation, how firms change with regards to their website outlook over time and with regards to all kinds of different topics, particularly interesting in times of rapid change as we have it now, for example, driven by the pandemic. So that's it. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. We have a question from, from the audience. Um, Ronaldo, Ronaldo has a question. Um, thanks, Hugo. Uh, thanks, Fabian, for, uh, for the presentation. I have one clarification and I guess and, and a question. So when you did your crawling, I was uh, slightly surprised that the number of websites or number of links that you actually reach, they don't grow exponentially like most of the crawling that people do. Um, oh, so... I, I'm, I'm trying to understand why that happened, right? So you have like 500 websites and then 600 and at some point even decreases. So why isn't this actually growing exponentially since each website, if I understood that each website would actually um, have more and more links. So when the question actually relates to the sentiment analysis and the dealing with different languages and perhaps cultures, right? So if you actually adjust for that, I mean, you have, I'm assuming that size from Hyundai, some of them will be in Korean. Uh, the the German one might be in German. Um, so yeah. So how 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 do you handle those differences, please? 
Uh, thank you very much. Very important questions, very good questions. Uh, I have to qualify that I didn't do the calling. This was done by the student Niklas Stör. Uh, my uh, top of my mind explanation would probably be that he just looked into the uh, subdomains uh, and they are uh, so the subdomains on the website um, and they are not growing too much. And I mean, if we look at Volkswagen, for example, we have one page um, on the highest level, then level 233, then 200, then 400, then 800. So it's it's growing quite quickly. I'm not sure whether this uh, answers the questions all, already, but we didn't look into any other out um, links, so links to other websites other than subdomains of vw.com. And with regard to the second question, um, can you actually still hear me? Because I cannot hear you anymore. See yeah, you. I, I can. So I was sorry. I was just uh, waiting for for the sorry, second sorry. question related to uh, the sentiment. Uh, yes. Sorry, uh, the video was just. It was just not moving anymore. And sorry, with regards to the sentiment, we um, conducted uh, the main analysis just on the American domain. Um, so we started with the .com domain where everything is in English. And uh, you point absolutely to an important aspect. If you were to apply this to a different context or to a global context, the sentiment analysis, which we did not, we applied the um, sentiment analysis only to the American context or to the English language context on the American website. If you were to do it, um, with different uh, language domains, then obviously you would run into problems that you have, um, that you would need to have uh, specific dictionaries or specifically trained dictionaries to do the sentiment analysis. This is a drawback that I should have mentioned actually, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much for this comment. Yeah, so 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 just to follow up here, so because you, it's, it wouldn't, wouldn't it be a more true representation of what the industry is doing I mean, I mean, again, this is a guess, right? I'm assuming that the most innovative things from Volkswagen will probably be in the German domain, right? So if you, then, then the American one, which probably they do not translate everything. And the same thing for Hyundai, right? So if they're doing something very innovative, it's probably going to be in their Korean. Wouldn't it be better to actually have the Toyota in Japanese, the Korean in uh, Hyundai in Korean and the Volkswagen in German as a true representation of how innovative they are? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, this all started here as a student project. So back then we tried to also keep it feasible and and, and doable uh, with regards to the time limit we had. Uh, and this is why we also decided to just go for the American version. As, sorry, and one other, one other point to mention here, we picked the American version because besides China, the US is the largest car market in the world. So it is one where, as we have seen also the um, the pure size of the website networks, uh, the companies are putting a lot of effort. So in this regard, it is comparable to that extent that you can assume that these three largest manufacturers are putting effort there. But you're absolutely right with regards to the home market, because we've seen also on the last slide that it is, um, which we didn't know before we did the analysis, uh, it, is, it seems to be uh, the most important single sub domain of each of the of each of the companies. You're absolutely right. This this is is something that should be um, taken into consideration. Um, an alternative would be if we were to replicate this study with a more specific country, a specific or regional um, focus, let's say, look into companies that are active in either just an English speaking country, the same country or the same market, then we could also compare this better. You're absolutely right. So this is, um, I, I see it as a prototype or as a test and we were surprised what we could find, but you're absolutely right. Uh, we should look into different um, country domains here, given that these are international, large transnational companies. Yeah, thank, All right, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo. Um, I, maybe we have time for one quick answer for, there's a question on YouTube um, by Clodovis Santana. He's, he's asking uh, if you made an analysis comparing the manufacturers that focus on different um, segments of the market, for example, companies that focus more on uh, luxury cars or others that like try to sell themselves as a more innovative company like Tesla. Uh, yeah, this could definitely be done. So uh, we try to, um, and again, I want to, I want to emphasize that we, it, that we um, started this as a, as a test, as a, as a prototype, just, you know, um, just putting one interesting industry into focus, into spotlight here. This is why we picked these three companies. We were surprised by the results, positively surprised how detailed the insights are given how simple the approach actually is. 
and uh, this could definitely be replicated. The only drawback that I would want to say is you can do this. You can compare all kinds of different companies, be it luxury brands, be it the individual brands of these car manufacturers. So for example, if you think about Volkswagen, they also own Audi and Porsche and other kind of um, brand that you could look into um, more specifically. And um, basically you could automatize this monitoring completely. But one other thing, one other important element that I would want to mention is it's also, uh, sorry, the website structure obviously is changing over time and it might, sometimes can depend from where you start. So if you start from uh, volkswagen.com or from vw.com, it might give you very different results than if you start from a different web page. So this is something that we uh, were still considering and discussing. Uh, but I think uh, the power of this tool could be seen more clearly if we were to replicate this for more specific, more smaller companies particularly, and for more companies at the same time, also with regards to car sales and other more industry specific um, indicators. Yes. Thank you very much, Fabian. Um, okay, so now we're gonna have the third presentation. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the, our next speaker, Babak to start sharing his screen. Fantastic. So, okay, our third speaker of the session is uh, Babak Ravandi. He is gonna be presenting the work, network-based approach for modeling and analyzing coronary angiography. And Babak, you're gonna have 15 minutes and I'm gonna let you know when you have five minutes left, okay? Thank you very so much. Just Hugo, the minute just come in, Babak, if you if you wish to do so, um, you could turn your camera on so that people on YouTube can actually um, see the presenter. But it's your choice. Just a reminder. Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, I had some difficulty with my controls. Thank you very much, Hugo, uh, for introducing me and the conference. Um, I am postdoctoral research associate at Northeastern University, uh, the Network Science Institute. And um, this project is a proof of concept that um, I am going through it. Um, so I'm going to, to talk about coronary angiography and how can we use networks to improve the interpretation of these images. Um, so, the coronary angiography is an invasive method, uh, which means that a type of dye is being injected into the patient's body from leg or hand that is only visible to an x-ray machine. And uh, with that, we can find uh, places that, uh, that uh, there is a calcium buildup. There are some problems there. There is a, st uh, there is a stenosis, for example that will block the flow of blood, hand causes a stroke and etc. cetera. Um, mostly these problems are coming because of metabolomic diseases or uh, consuming highly processed food in our society. But um, so our focus is how to use networks, how to derive this network uh, and then use it from, the, uh, from a coronary angiography image. So the motivation uh, behind the work is that, of course, CHD, coronary uh, heart disease, is a major um, cause of death. And uh, it is the gold standard for both follow-up and uh, identifying um, conditions, uh, various conditions. Uh, however, there exists a potential observer error of 35% um, from performing visual inspections of these pictures by a specialist. And also we all know that um, human body, uh, the organs are complex systems. So we were wondering if we can use uh, the tools provided uh, from complex system theory to, um, to have a better insight on this problem. Objectives are to model the cardiovascular tree as a complex network derived from angiography images and also to gain insights on the functions of cardiovascular system from the structure of the coronary networks. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the existing quantitative approaches and their limitations. And then I go over methodology, uh, one case study 
and uh, I'll conclude the work. So quantitative approaches, uh, uh, QCA, are emerging uh, to minimize the observer error, also to perform prediction and analysis. And um, these approaches are um, very um, advanced. Uh, however, most of them are mostly relying also on uh, visual inspections of the um, arteries. And as we can see, for example, at this work, they're able to completely make a 3D model of the coronary uh, arteries with uh, angiography images. Uh, so, however, they lack sufficient accuracy to be employed for clinical purposes. And uh, the reason is several phenomena can lead QCA approaches toward over or underestimation, uh, such as side branches and bifurcation, uh, and etc. And uh, so the main limitation of QCA approaches uh, remains on capturing physiological characteristics of these uh, phenomena uh, that are technically hard to measure by the imaging uh, techniques itself. And uh, for this, and also going back to the same problem that we had with uh, a specialist, Again, QVC approaches are performing and relying on performing visual inspections. Uh, however, we know if we have a network, we can actually uh, go ahead and connect it with the dynamics of the system. We can, on the top of visual inspections, we can use all the tools of network science to conduct more analyses, derive features for machine learning and etc. The, so to construct a network uh, and create a collective view of the heart coronary circulation system, uh, we worked on creating a map of heart coronary uh, arteries. And um, um, also uh, analyze network structure function relationships. So here is an example. Um, so we did this on only two cases. One is a healthy case and disease case. Um, and we have done this with hand uh, since it's just a proof of concept. Uh, so the next step would be automating all of these works, uh, which there exists as research, as I showed in previous slides that have done extracting even 3D construction of the arteries from angiography pictures. Uh, so the nodes are basically the junctions between the vessels, as we can see. And um, the weights uh, are the length of the vessel times its diameter. And here's the uh, structure of the network definition. Um, so we only looked at the left coronary arteries only on one picture. And um, on the right side, we have the disease case, left side, we have the healthy case. And just looking at the, um, some statistics, we can see that clustering coefficient of the healthy case is uh, comparably uh, higher than the disease case. I'll get to this soon. Why is that happening? And I'm going to present three network assessments on degree distribution, integration, and controllability. Uh, so first, on the just simple visualization on a circular layout, we can see that uh, these motifs, these uh, lump the uh, um, motifs uh, branches, these are occurring way more in the disease case, and this process is related to neovascularization phenomena. When the body is having hard time to circulate the blood, it's trying to create new micro vessels, and uh, that is clearly captured here. Looking at the degree distribution, uh, so first, there is not much of a difference, but if you look at the quartiles, we can see that the in degree distribution um, in the disease case is concentrated in the third quartile, whereas in the healthy is concentrated in the fourth quartile. The next assessment is assessment of integration. 
Um, so looking at three measurements, shortest path length, routing efficiency, and search information, basically if you have a random worker, how much information do you need to walk over the shortest path? Um, here uh, we have the uh, uh, all the values for the, all the nodes uh, on, on these matrices um, uh, for all these three different measurements. And uh, so looking at the top 10 person, we can see that uh, the search information is um, um, lower than, uh, the, than the disease case meaning that in the disease case, the worker had a harder time to find, randomly find uh, shortest path. Um, and we can see more efficiency on the healthy case. And also um, we can see that the shortest path are longer on the healthy case compared to disease case, um, which are interesting. These all can be furthermore investigated in, um, in in a larger sample to derive statistics and see how significant they are. Um, so uh, last assessment, assessment of the controllability, uh, which is controllability itself is a, a study of um, how can we bring a system from um, an initial state to a desired state. Um, and in order to do that, we need to apply stimulus. And, um, and um, so applying the stimulus on some nodes in the network, let's call them driver nodes. Um, and uh, so there are analytical ways to identify these driver nodes. Um, so that's, that's a problem uh, reduced to maximum matching problem in directed networks. Uh, so there is an efficient algorithm that you can find these driver nodes that under um, linear time uh, invariant dynamics can control the whole network. So just, just looking at the driver nodes, a set of driver nodes, a minimum driver nodes set, we can see that on the healthy case, um, we have more driver nodes than the disease case, which is interesting. Disease case easier to be controlled, um, which um, again, showing that it's more vulnerable because it's easier to be controlled. Um, if um, these red nodes, a few of them are basically having problem, then it might cause a stroke. Um, so that was counterintuitive and uh, interesting to see. And uh, so to conclude here- About are five minutes. Sure, thank you. Uh, so observations and conclusions, um, so we propose a network-based approach for modeling uh, heart's cardiovascular angiography images to, uh, that is capable of analyzing the structure of a heart cardiovascular system. Um, so we, we can use that on the top of uh, looking at the angles, looking at the uh, image um, characteristics um, of the, these images. And uh, so, new features based on network assessment can be used. Um, and the reason we didn't move forward to do it on a larger sample of angiography was um, I was doing this work as, um, as a project for a course in my PhD. And um, so it just turned out to be uh, a good work. I was interested, I just continued and then, you know, um, and then this work got the shape as it is right now, but we are um, interested to moving forward with this. Um, a little bit background, similar approaches has been done on eye, which were very successful on um, identifying diseases. And um, here are some more up, um, recommendations that how we can basically move forward and completely automate this. Um, and um, what and what are the next steps? Um, and uh, these are the uh, references to this work. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baba. Um, I, I I have there's a question from 
from the audience. So um, Zixun is asking um, about the driver nodes. How do you identify these driver nodes from other nodes? Sure, there, there, there are some algorithms uh, that, that are very well known. Um, there is a paper called uh, The Controllability of Complex Networks. I believe it was in 2011, uh, published in Nature. Um, so there is an algorithm based on maximum matching on the directed uh, graphs that with those you can find a minimum driver node set. A network can have multiple minimum driver node sets, but it's they're all the same size of driver nodes. Thank you very much. There's another question from the audience. Guillermo is asking if are there more cases for healthy and disease uh, angiograms to compare with because he's saying that the differences could be uh, coming from differences uh, between the, the individuals, the subjects or measuring machines and so on. Yeah, that's, that's completely right. Um, we had that uh, in the process of peer review, that's question that, um, so the results are not a statistical significance. Um, so of course, this needs to be, this is a proof of concept. This needs to be applied on a larger set data set of coronary angiography and not just on one angle, not just left coronary images. Uh, angiography has a lot of more images into it. Um, I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to find time to do it uh, during my PhD, finishing of my PhD. Uh, my focus was on controllability of temporal networks. Um, but um, I, I have a feeling based on other works on eye, for example, that uh, such an approach can be also applied on heart. So that's for the future work, basically. Thank you very much. Um, I have one. I have one question um, mm -hmm. because when you, we, we one of the things that we analyze in networks is this concept of robustness. So in this case, I was wondering to what extent a network-based approach uh, to the analysis of these angiograms they could be indicative of a more robust individual or or a let's say a less susceptible individual to to death or to a certain disease. So could you, do you think that a methodology like this could be able to predict or to estimate the likelihood of someone dying from a cardiovascular disease or not? And if that's the case, what network properties do you think would be better indicative of this kind of robustness? Uh, sure. I, I think it, yes, uh, this could be able to provide predictions. Um, so a lot of um, um, diagnosis are done by, the, by practitioners. Um, so let's remember they're based on, they would be able to identify some abnormally in the images. So identify it either by just going through it with eye or a machine with a quantitative approach with image processing, um, uh, which means that the um, disease must be acute enough to be noticeable. Uh, however, if um, we adopt an approach like this, we, are, we might be able even to identify some problems are going to happen before it's becoming too acute to be visible. Because, like you mentioned, there are so many different measurements. Uh, I think just analysis of integration itself looks very promising. Um, just looking at the degree distribution, looking at the path, um, so different orders of the network. I think all of them can be uh, can be promising. I just uh, analyzed three different network measurements and they showed, they showed a big difference. Um, and this, this comes back again to um, automating this to all angles of the heart. Right now it was only the left coronary. Um, using the work that has already been done on extracting um, 
3D construction of the vessels and then use those 3D construction to make it a network and then uh, basically do whatever we can with the network. I think it can work. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, who starts doing it, you know. Thank you very much, Babak. So um, with uh, Babak's uh, presentation, we, we end our, uh, the, the fourth, session of our Complanet live. Um, now we are, just a second. Now we are gonna have a lunch break from noon until uh, 1.50 when we are coming back with our fifth and last session of our Complanet live. Thank you very much, you all, for being with us today. Thank you very much for the speakers of, the, of our session. And thank you all on YouTube as well for participating in, in the conference. And see you all in, uh, at 1.50.